At the westernmost limits of Britain sit two proud neighbours, shaped by the sea. Devon, a luscious county boasting two national parks. Proper people, proper county, proper cream tea. Yes. And hundreds of miles of dramatic coast. Grew up, lived up, loved up. Everything about Devon, I love. And across the River Tamar, Cornwall. Yeah! The ancient granite kingdom of Kurno, thrusting out into the Atlantic. I have travelled the world, but I always come home. Where old ways enrich the new. Mike Bell, get up. It's a very special place, been here for 100 years. Millions of visitors head west each year. Some choose to stay for good. It's just so unbelievably varied. I love that feeling of freedom. This is my little bit of heaven in Devon. Whether born here or drawn here, there are still many deep-rooted folk. Always looking at the judge. Proudly holding on to their heritage and creating their own future. I love the ocean and to be part of something which is within our county's history. You have to keep working hard to stay here, but we're glad we're here. These are the stories of the people who call Devon and Cornwall home. At the beating heart of Devon, Dartmoor rises skyward. Granite tours punch up through a sweeping landscape of rough ground and wild open spaces. On the north side of the moor, near the town of Oakhampton, is the parish of Throwley, where Crispin Orford has tended his flock for over half a century. Well, I first started keeping sheep on the moor when I was about 12 year old. So that's well over 50 years ago now. <laughs> Dartmoor is in Crispin's blood. And just like the generations of farmers that have gone before him, Crispin has raised his son Steve in the ways of working the moor. Just getting the horses ready now, and uh, we're going to go and uh, gather some sheep off the moor, ready for shearing tomorrow. Sheep have been grazed on the moor for thousands of years, and every year, farmers must fetch in their shaggy strays for a short back and sides. We go here, go up um, over this, this side of the moor, and get on, the, on the, up on the side there in the bracken, and if you go over towards Shilston, through the bracken, and I'll go up towards Shelley Pool. And take them up to the top, and then we'll get them together, and then come down over yeah. all in one. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's all right? Yep. We'll do that, then. Right, let's get going. Yeah. I've always enjoyed going out pinning the stock on Dartmoor and gathering them in this time of the year. This is the one time of the year we can get them all together and see what we've got, lamb-wise and everything else. And um, if there's a problem with something, we can de deal with it. So it's a good time of year to do it. Dartmoor doesn't make things easy. Stands of gorse and rampant bracken create plenty of hidey holes for shy sheep. There's, there'll be sheep over in the, over in the bushes, I expect. They keep appearing, don't they? So we'll gradually get them. The biggest cha challenge is, is trying to find the sheep. The bracken is quite thick around, especially around the edge of the moor, um, and trying to flush the sheep out of the undergrowth and uh, gather them all up into one, one big bunch and bring them in. Mind your dog, Stephen. Yeah, Judge, hey! On a beautiful day like this, you know, you can look for miles and, you know, it's a beautiful place to be. Perfect office to be in. It's one of the areas we live in here, but it is a working environment. And um, it's not always easy, but it's what we do and uh, what we enjoy.
Sheep safely gathered in off the ancient moorland, all set for the next skirmish, shearing. Yeah, well, I think that went quite well, really. It did, really, better than I thought. I said the weather conditions are ideal for this job, but uh, once we got them together, they ran in very well. And uh, most of them were fairly fit by the looks of it, too. But it'd be good to get the wool off their backs and have a look at them, wouldn't it? Have a look at the condition and everything. So, uh, yeah, went very well. East Devon, an ancient corner of an ancient county that was once a hive of medieval industry. 20 miles east of Exeter lies Colliton, a town home to wool merchants, blacksmiths and tanners since Saxon times. And to this day, the town preserves one of the oldest trades known to man. With the work that we do, you have to put a bit of your soul into it. We try and get into the head of the people who made it in the first place. It's not just a job, it's a passion that just happens to be a job. Greg Rowland and his father, Mike, are master wheelwrights, the only such pairing in the world. One, two, three, four, five, six, which is exactly what I want. Making wheels is in their DNA. Dad taught me to be a wheelwright. We've got it traced in our family back to 1331. So if we, can, if we can't do it now, we ought to stop. This is a very rare workshop these days. We basically make lots of things that people don't know how to anymore. And Dad is of such an age that he remembers the old-fashioned joinery and there's quite a high demand for it. I'm still on imperial measurements. I don't want to know about these damn French millimetres and that. I'm on feet and inches, and I don't want to change. <laughs> He's 82. He works every day. Now, he does what he wants, which is fair enough, because um, I hope I could do what I want when I was 82. Although it's an ancient trade, their handiwork is still in high demand. Orders are rolling in, and Greg and Mike need all the shoulders to the wheel they can get. Seven years ago, they took on an apprentice, George, who's steadily training up to be a wheelwright in his own right. There's not a lot of people doing this sort of thing, especially at my age. It is very important to keep it going so we don't lose these sort of trades. So I'm here to take that on and teach the other younger generation, hopefully in the future. People think this is a nice, quaint old trade and we can tick along. Actually, it's all about deadlines. In the workshop at the moment, I've got two farm wagons that have been restored, a brand new show dray, a brand new horse bus, and that's just the big jobs. If I could find another two Georges, I'd have them tomorrow. And to add to the load, they've received orders to supply the Royal Navy with a very special commission. Plans have just arrived for a new gun carriage to be stowed on board the historic ship HMS Warrior. What have they drawn this from the photographs, have they? This is sort of half an 1850s Napoleonic field carriage with the Armstrong gun on it. It's got much smaller wheels than you'd expect the gun to have, but that's because it's on board ship. So it's only got three foot six wheels. Unusual dev wheels on board ship, anyway. Well, not these, because these are unloading field carriages. Oh, I see. So these are guns they're taking to go to battle with, not oh, guns they're firing from the ship. Every element of the carriage must be constructed to meticulous measurements, robust enough to heft an Armstrong gun weighing three quarters of a ton. They tin very wide across there. No, it's not very wide. It, well, in French, 575 mil, so 22 inches across and it's needed in just six weeks' time. Everything's always tight. There's always deadlines. Yeah. But there, that's life. And they always sit on it and talk about it for three years. 
<laughs> and then suddenly decide we want no. Yeah, that is pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. Later in Devon and Cornwall, the hill sheep of Dartmoor are off to the barbers. These are the most important bits of your kit, cutters and combs. Have a good, Have a good day. day. See you later. Chef Greg Milne serves up the best natural ingredients Cornwall has to offer. You can't get much more local than this. It's like my wild larder. And wheelwright Greg Rowland creates another little piece of history. Hey, Doc, George. In the heart of Devon, father and son farmers Crispin and Steve Alford run their animals on the wild wilderness that is Dartmoor. Out on the moors, it's not just a, anybody's place. You've got to be born and bred to it, really, to really appreciate it, if you like, and be able to handle it, you know? It's shearing time on the farm, and the unshorn sheep are ripe for a haircut. These are mainly uh, Scotch black-faced sheep, um, and there's a few South Country chiviots mixed in with them. I down. Steady. I down, Jack. I down. Steady. Steady. Steve has been shearing for over 20 years and he knows that a good shear needs good gear. These are the most important bits of your kit, cutters and combs. You don't set your gear up or have your gear sharp. Game over in it. Nearly all shearers wear moccasins. So if you wear wore boots, for instance, with a heel, it puts more pressure on your back when you're bending over shearing, and um, so it takes the pressure off your back a little bit. Footwork is very important. You're moving the sheep all the time. It is technique and uh, getting your gear running right, um, and uh, lots and lots of practice. It's a tough old truck, a job that demands both raw strength and ticklish technique to rein in the sheep and remove the fleece all in one piece. And things have changed a brave bit since Steve's dad Crispin was shearing. I used to do a lot of shearing at one time and uh, the old back, I, won't, uh, I enjoy this odd. One or two sheep just to keep my hand in, but uh, they're giving me this job, Robert, marking the sheep now. I got the boys' job now, that's what I got, yeah. We used to shoot about 100 a day, and we thought that was fantastic. So these boys are on 250, maybe 300 a day, you know, and that's the difference from the gear they got to use. The kit and caboodle may have changed, but the skill of shearing is still the same as it was centuries ago. And it's a traditional craft that Crispin trusts will carry on for keeps. You know, we, we used to she always had somebody to help me shear, you know, and then for Stephen come along and learn the business. And if he uh, produces a son one day or a daughter, don't matter to me. It'd be great, wouldn't it? It'd be great. It goes on again. <laughs> Although shearing is hard work, it brings the local farming community together. And in a few weeks' time, Steve will be hosting and competing in Dartmoor Speed Shearing Competition. We're really lucky in the southwest. We get a lot of uh, world-class shearers uh, here, you know, for the season, and they come along and uh, enter the competition. And uh, yeah, we have some really good top-quality shearing here. I think I'm a bit out of practice at the moment, actually.
and get packed up now and go to the pub. Harvesting nature's gifts has forever been part and parcel of life along the Cornish coast, whether on land or at sea. The seafood from these crystal clear waters is world renowned. Crab, oysters, and glorious white fish. Yo! Hey, well, I like that. Morning. You're right? You're doing really good. For Chef Greg Milne, Cornwall is a happy hunting ground, a culinary kingdom of delights. It's a special place, and I love seafood, I love the coast. And he has an amazing spot to cook up his creations. Two miles east of Penzance is the stunning tidal island of Caracaloos in Coos, St. Michael's Mount. Tourists throng to the island through the summer months, and Greg is set to feed the thousands of hungry visitors. I really like raw seafood and cured seafood. Anything that's seasonal and particularly sustainable, I really, really love. But Greg's passion for Cornish provenance produce goes beyond the bounds of the fish market. Some damsons in the hedge grow here. This is what foraging is, is all about for me. It's got to be a challenge. Once you've gotten something that you've sort of really labored for, you know, oh, well, it just feels more worthwhile. The fresh fruits and green herbs he gathers regularly make it onto the restaurant menu. And now he's out scavenging, hunting for inspiration for a new dish. Look how irregular that is. You couldn't sell that in the shop. You just couldn't do it. Ordinarily overlooked, even wild weeds can contribute a dash of dazzle to a dish. I like using nettles um, because I think when when you use them raw, which I plan to do with the sauce, um, blitzed up, I think they have a really fresh cucumber flavor. Your tongue's not stung or anything like that, you know. But it kind of does lend a slightly peppery element to it. And it's not just the Cornish mainland that offers Greg the freshest of wild ingredients. There aren't too many jobs, particularly chefing jobs, where you're, you're getting a boat to work, so it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty incredible, really. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Tom. See you later. Have a good Have day. A good day. See, See you later. later. With a footprint of under one square mile, St. Michael's Mount may be miniature, but the isle still boasts many tempting plants to pluck. You can't get much more local than this. It's like my wild larder. Sea beet or wild spinach, chard and spinach were all cultivated from this wild plant. So this is very much the original um, spinach, if you like. Inside the island's kitchen, Greg gets to work creating his new special. Lightly cured pollock in a wild herb gremolata on a bed of cuttlefish ink sauce. It smells like the sea, which is important. It doesn't smell fishy. Yeah, this is, this is going to be beautiful. The sea beet, the nettles here, are all going to go into the wild gremolata. It's quite acidic, um, vibrant and, and fresh. A little bit more. Super simple. This is literally the, fin the finishing touch. This is the, the dish. Greg's new dish, featuring the finest foraged fodder, is now complete. And the time has come to see what people make of it. Lovely. Very nice indeed. Starts with quite zingy and then get like a bit of a creaminess in it. And the, the pollock as well, you can taste it, that's really fresh. Certainly different from the sort of fish and chips I normally go for, um, but it is really delicious. Happy diners mean a happy Greg, and he couldn't be more appreciative of the delights on his doorstep. You often take it for granted, and then when you see views like this, you know, you know how stunning this place is. At the north end of Colleton in East Devon, 
time seemingly stands still. But busy hands are working away in much the same way as their ancestors. You step into the workshop and you're walking into history. Everything we do is historical. Father and son master wheelwrights Mike and Greg Rowland, along with apprentice George, are setting up the workshop for their latest commission. We'll make sure we use it square nuts, because this is, what, 1860? Yeah. And it's going to the Royal Navy, so it's got to be bang on. A new gun carriage, soon to be on show aboard the historic ship HMS Warrior. Being as I'm ex-forces, I do like the military stuff, the gun stuff. So this gun has got to be built and on the deck of HMS Warrior in Portsmouth uh, within six weeks. It gets scary when I keep saying that. With the deadline looming, all other jobs are stood down. And apprentice George turns to the task. I think Greg's worried, but we'll definitely be able to smash it out. You're meant to measure the gap, but I just do it by eye now. When, you, when you've done a load of them anyway, you just... It's just those sorts of things that you pick up. How's that one going all right? Yeah, he's fit up lovely. Yeah, he looks pretty good. Ideal. What's he spin like? bad. Nearly better than mine. True. Better getting bonded. Yep. Hand-built wooden wheels like these don't sport newfangled rubber tyres. The steel tyre is the most essential part of this wheel, really, because what it does is it cramps the whole wheel and all the joints tight. So we have to measure the outside of the wheel that we've made, transferring what I've just measured on the outside of that wheel to the inside of the cold tyre. It's quite important that it's cold as well. So, measure twice, cut once. Measure three times even. Sometimes even four if you're not sure. Each metal tyre is cut to size, then welded intact. Before being bonded onto the wheel, George, you're ready to go. What we're looking for on the tyre, when it's hot enough, it goes like a gunmetal grey. I don't know the degrees. He's off, George. You could hold it, and if George, you could hold it one side. Just keep your tamper on it. The reason I call it quickly is because I don't want it to burn the wheel, which would leave a ring of carbon underneath the tyre. And eventually, if that's going down the road, that could rattle out. But I think you two can let up now. It's a time-honoured technique still alive and well in the 21st century. And George is settling up, as we call it. So the noise is all important. We check it by, believe it or not, dropping it. It should sound like a drum. So that sounds, and it bounces as well. So that means everything there is tight. You can hear it's tight. It sounds like a drum. The gun carriage is slowly but surely taking shape. I'll lift, you take the trestle out. No, it'll flip when you do, so you yeah. keep your hand on the air. So... Didn't want that to happen. It's got to roll back to you, though. So it's flush with the top of the trail. Up here, yeah? Yeah, that's it. These are the best bits, because you see something happening. That's looking quite smart. I quite like that. I wouldn't have wanted to be one of the crew pulling this. The barrel's three quarters of a ton. He's starting to look like a gun now. Yeah. I'm happy with it. 
and it's quite nice as well that George has made one up and I've made the other. With the carriage nearly complete, all that remains is to varnish up and finally fit the original Armstrong gun aboard the famous HMS Warrior. I'm really looking forward to seeing it on board the ship. That'll look fantastic. Later, in Devon and Cornwall... So, first time in 30 years, then. Brian Phipps takes to the skies over Perranporth. Forgotten what it's like to be a bird. We get some of the world's best shearers turn up. On Dartmoor, Steve is preparing to welcome the world to his speed shear competition. At the end of the day, it's a bit of fun for everybody. Where the rolling waves meet dramatic skies on the North Cornish coast, most visitors merely dip their toes in the water or keep their feet firmly on the golden sand. But hang gliding instructor Graham Phipps believes that a bird's eye view is the best way to behold Cornwall's spectacular scenery. For Graham, Hang gliding is a bug that began with his brother, Brian. They both learned to fly in their early 20s, taking wing over Perranporth Beach. Morning, bruv. Hey, how you doing? Here you go, Bri. Bit of history for you. And that was out at Perran. That was the first time we ever... But you shouted out, I'm free, I'm free, and we managed to fly for about 30 seconds. That's right. Top to bottom. While Graham made hang gliding his career, Brian's been tied up running his own catamaran business, leaving little time for flying. Now newly retired, he's giving his previous pastime another world to celebrate. Right, OK, let's see what you can do. So if you imagine now... Yep. Right, you're actually in the air. Yep. What feeling is that giving you? Well, it gives me the same excitement that I had then. I can't say that I'm not a bit nervous after 30 years. The brothers are heading back to Perranporth Towns, the dunes where their fervour for flying first began. Yeah, well, talk me through, remind me. I don't want to forget a bit. Yeah, that's it. Jeez, I hope he knows what he's doing. So, pop these wheels on, Bri. Okay. I think it might be an idea. You, you've gone quiet, Bri. You that's because I've got something in my mouth. Oh, yeah, that's it. I'll let you. Well, Just... I am quiet because I am concentrating. And once I've got my first flight in, I'll be a lot more happy about it. But, you know, life is about challenges. At the moment, I'm feeling just a little bit excited. It's been a long time. Um, he managed to put a hang glider together in nearly the right manner. He knows which way it points, so that's good. OK, Bright. Let's put that on. OK, we need to catch this little spell while it's good. So, first time in 30 years, then? First time in 30 years. I don't know whose heart's pounding more, yours or mine. Uh. <laughs> so, let's walk down to the front a little. Feel the glider as you go. Righty, Bri. Wind's come in. Are you good? Yeah, I'm good. Wings level. Go. Run, run, run. Right, now. Don't, no panic, get into prone. Let her fly. That's great, Fry. How's that feel? Yeah! Almost a hundred metres in the air, Brian soars over the spectacular Cornish coastline. I've forgotten what it's like to be a bird or a seagull. It, it is like riding a push bike. He's back at it. I, I mean, I'd just love to be up there to see the grin on his face. Stunning. Way over to the left. Glider turns and just cruise across. 
What a wonderful, wonderful feeling. And what a wonderful, wonderful view. I see Perrin Paul, St Agnes Head. And I'm starting now to relax a bit and then just enjoy the, the scenery. That's got to bring back so many memories. He's got to come down and go, why haven't I been doing that for the last 30 years? All too soon, the winds begin to drop, and it's time for Brian to come back down to earth. I think I'd better turn and get myself back in over the cliff. OK, bring her round to your left now. Drift in towards me. Your legs out. Hands on the uprights gently. Keep her coming and bring her into wind. Wings level, wings level. All right, relax. So don't push out, keep that tiny bit of airspeed. Now, pull in hard. Go on, pull in hard, hard, hard. Keep it in, keep it in, keep it in, keep it in. Run it, go on. Give it in, mate. Cheers. Give it in. Well done, Cheers. well done. I've done it. <laughs> the view, the feeling, just being like a bird, it was fantastic. I've been waiting for that for years. Three decades have drifted away in a single afternoon, and Brian and Graham can now look forward to spending more time together up aloft. Because we did so much flying together, and then we stopped and went different directions, it is like sort of making a re rebuilding an old friendship. Paranport always is a special place. For a day to come together like today, and to see him fly the way he flew, come in and land that thing back on top, First go, no overshoot. It's, uh, it's incredible. <laughs> On the northern edge of Dartmoor in Devon, Steve and Crispin Alford are gearing up for their speed cheer gathering. We're really lucky in the southwest we get some of the world's best shearers turn up. We've got two competitions, up to intermediate, then an open competition. With hundreds of competitors and spectators expected, there's a brave old bit to knock into shape. Titch, there's a chain on the floor there. I don't know if we can use that. I've been working hard. I've been working hard for all for the benefit of my neighbours, my next door neighbours. That's what I've been. I've been a lot of input I've put in. <laughs> oh dear, no mind. Well, we're going to put a piece of Harris fencing across the corner. It's the first time Steve and his partner Haley have hosted the event on their new farm. So there's pressure to make sure the nuts and bolts are spot on. Just enjoy themselves. It's all we'd like, really. Just make it a really successful night. As a competitor himself, Steve is well aware that a shearer is only as good as his tools. With his cutters glistening sharp and all other preparations in place, the final task is to muster the sheep to take a breather before the competition begins. Hopefully they're all there. This weather is ideal. It's hot and when the sheep sweat, when you're shearing and that, it, everything goes much better. Um, it's like, I suppose, when, when you go to the hairdressers and, and then they wash your hair before you have your hair cut. Same sort of thing. You know, the sheep will sweat and it goes a lot, lot easier. So it would be great, perfect conditions for shearing tonight. Later, in Devon and Cornwall... Morning. Morning, Greg. How's it going? Yeah, good. 
Greg the Wheelwright takes a trip to Portsmouth to see his handcrafted gun carriage installed aboard HMS Warrior. Seeing something like this on board deck here, it makes it all worthwhile, really. And in Devon, hundreds arrive at Elven Farm for the speed cheer competition. Judges ready, timekeepers ready, competitors go! In North Devon, master wheelwright Greg Rowland is embarking on a journey to complete a very special commission. He's driving over a hundred miles east from his workshop in Colleton to Portsmouth in Hampshire. I'm on the way to the Royal Naval Dockyard where they keep the historic ships. HMS Warrior has undergone quite a major revamp, sort of refit, and part of that was making a new gun carriage. And now we're on the way to do the final fitment, the lifting of the actual gun into the new carriage. Quite a rare sight, seeing the old barrel going into a brand new gun carriage. Can't wait to see it on, on the ship. The ship's a, a really impressive thing. And hopefully what I've made will only enhance that. Britain's first iron-hulled battleship, HMS Warrior, was the fastest and most powerful of her day. Launched in 1860, she was the pride of Queen Victoria's naval fleet. And now welcomes thousands of visitors on board every year. I'm a bit nervous. I've made it to the plans I was given, and hopefully those plans were, um, were right. Morning. Morning, Greg. How's it going? Yeah, good. Ready for this? Yeah. I want to make sure the gun fits. Ready? Right, shall we, shall we run these carriages down and let's get these on board? If we can lash it around the axle so that axle support as we go up, yeah. that'd be great. Heavy one first. Just want to see it on deck, really. Yeah, we'll get it on deck and let's see how this fits. skilled people are getting it on deck and that um, that went really well. I remember it being this heavy. How far are we going? The carriage has been built in two parts and once these are fitted together the antique Armstrong gun weighing three quarters of a ton can be positioned. All good so far we're on the deck. The riggers are going to lift the gun. Now it's the litmus test see if it really works. This is the point that I want to see done, and the, the old barrel lifted into the, to the new carriage. This is the first time I've set foot on the Warrior. It is impressive. Its history sort of comes and whacks you a little bit. So I should be really proud to see this in there and done and stowed away. Thank Christ for that. I can breathe again now. <laughs> and he's straight. It's another thing you've got to... If you get the turning slightly off, the gun's going to fire to the left all the time, so that's good. Try and follow the same lines as before. Yeah. All that's left to do now is move the fully assembled gun into position. That's almost impossible. Are we spinning now? Yeah, we have made a mess on that. <laughs> and then we're going back. So I think that's about where we want to be on a mark. It's going down. An ancient trade that has stood the test of time has brought the past back to the present for everyone to enjoy. I like that. Yeah. All good. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Ali. For Greg, it's a moment to step back and appreciate the living history of his family trade, knowing that his master wheelwright's knowledge will continue to be cherished. My family's been wheelwrights in Devon since 1331. And seeing something like this on board deck here, it makes you feel good. It shines a little light on Devon, I think, and the skills we have down there. It makes it all worthwhile, really.
on Steve Alford's farm on Dartmoor, sheep shearers from far and wide are arriving to take part in a speed shearing competition. The sheep have all been rested, ready and waiting for their big moment. Although a few seem to have a touch of stage fright. Oh, look up. Bloody hell. Too bad, was it? Try breaking out. We'll follow you over then, Rob. All right. <clears throat> With the sheep en route, crowds are gathering, ready to watch some top notch shearing. I think it's looking quite good. It looks like there's quite a few people here. A lot more, more relieved now than what I was a couple of hours ago try, when we were trying desperately to get everything prepared and ready. It's a great turnout, with shearers from around the world all set to go head to head, each one aiming to clock up the quickest clip. Judges ready, timekeepers ready, competitors go! A little bit nervous but when you've been doing it as long as uh, well, I have, you know, I guess you take it in stride to a certain extent. Look at Lizzie go. It's good fun and all this year are great lads to have a bit of fun with and that. And, uh, it's, a, it's a great sport to be in, really. This will be a fast time for Lizzie here. That's it, huh? Everyone is revelling in the cut and thrust competition. Finally, it's time for Steve to prove his prowess in front of a home crowd. Come on, Steve. We don't expect you to run, but you can look like you're coming this way. Hey! Here he comes. But here, the last of the heats. George Mudge on one, Steve Alford on two. Judges ready, timekeepers ready, competitors go. George is uh, first one up the net. Come on, George. Come on, George. The biggest applause tonight. Well done, Steve. Not in the slowest time, but the biggest applause. Well done, George. After a skillful showing from Steve, it's time for the pros to make way for the next generation. Local youngsters, Lizzie and Zach, are about to battle it out in the final of the intermediate category in a two sheep shear. Judges, ready. The fastest and cleanest shearer will get the glory. Timekeepers, ready. Competitors, go! But Lizzie's powering away as she gets into those long blues and steps over the center. And then the pink for number two together. Left and right, this is. Get behind them. Come on, Lizzie, get behind them, ladies and gentlemen. It all comes down to the judge's final decision. Lizzie's got two green, that's good enough for Lizzie. Really good in this evening shearing. Did a fantastic job and swept the board and the boys. Well done, Lizzie. Thanks to younger generations like these following in the footsteps of former times, Dartmoor's shepherding days are far from over. I think it's gone very well today, actually. Um, we've had a lot of people turn up to watch today, and uh, a lot of shearers that have turned up, and uh, we've had some uh, um, you know, great contests on the, on the boards. Moorland farming is a tough calling, but traditional skills like shearing pull the whole community together. 
for work and for play, for fun and for friendship. And long may they continue to do so. Next time in Devon and Cornwall... This is my little bit of heaven in Devon. Rare breed sheep farmer Leslie Perrett does her bit to save one of the West Country's finest. Like my world, really. I love the long walls. It'd be a travesty, really, if they died out. One of those manic days. On the silly Isle of Tresco, preparations are underway for a tidal event. The location is just... it's mind-bending. It's a richly nourishing place to live. And artist Steve Playdale Pierce ventures off to new and daring landscapes. It's absolutely stunning. This is Devon and it's best.